ready to start. They've been muted. Everybody. I am Jeremy Williams, and I am a uh, county extension agent uh, for Ag and Natural Resources in Harlan County, and it's good to see everybody this evening. And uh, uh, I will say that uh, when we had planned, when we when we planned this sec this segment, uh, we actually had an A number one photographer that was going to join us, uh, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to join us this evening. So you've got me. So basically what I'm going to do is, uh, is give some tips, but I will ask a question first. Do I have anybody on here that I would refer to as a professional photographer or an advanced amateur? Because I'm going to turn this over to you all. <laughs> uh, so I hope that some of you are, are, are doing some photography and I see some chats coming up. I see Aaron says no and Jaquita says uh, no says I. All right. Uh, so y'all, y'all not taking that bait, uh, and that, that works, that works. And Chad's saying no too. So, um, so we'll just, we'll just progress through things and Chiquita says, although I try really hard to try is the best part and I'm having a little issue with advancing here. All right. So. Why do we take photos? Any, uh, I mean, you can open your mic up and let me know why you take photos. Why do, why do we take photos? What, I've got some ideas, but why do y'all take photos? To try to remember stuff because I forget pretty easily. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, Aaron. Uh, I like that. Try to remember stuff, forget easy. Uh, you know, I'm the same way. There's a lot of times that I'll go and take a picture of something just to, you know, it may be a barcode or something like that or the password on the back of the, uh, the, uh, the modem or something like that. Uh, so those are, that's definitely a good one. Uh, uh, maybe to market the county to capture memorable mo moments to be creative. I like those. I like those. Um, and I see somebody else coming in here. Uh, proof of having done something. There you go. <laughs> so, Photo stop time. Uh, and basically we have, you know, I, I stopped a wreck from happening uh, from at, at Bristol Motor Speedway several years ago. And the lower right hand corner is an old photo that I took at Shad's house. Uh, Shad, that's actually uh, in the flower bed there next to your house between you and your neighbor on the right hand side. Uh, I took several photos that day and uh, of a honey bean sus suspension. So photo stop time. They allow you to create those memories. Like we mentioned, brings back memories. Now, one of the things that I, there's two things that I can remember about this photo. Uh, that's my dad on the left uh, on the international with a hay rake and his brother on the right bale and hay. This was the last time that they baled hay together. Uh, and then also I remember this was a cicada year and I can remember the cicadas that day were deafening. And it's almost by looking at the pictures that I can still see them or still hear them today. So they bring back memories. They even tell stories. Um, yeah, you've got a sign there that says no, no swimming. It's at Camp Blanton here in Harlan County. And it also, uh, it shows that the lake is frozen. So basically, I'm not going to give you any big tips. I'm just trying to help you out and trying to, um, uh, uh, maybe help you think uh, along the way because you know that's that's how I gather some stuff. It just allows me to see things and think along the way. So tell stories as well. So traveling with your camera. Do you all travel with a camera? Now I'm not talking about a, a phone, but uh, do you all travel with a camera? I know I used to travel with a camera every day. The last thing I did as I walked out of the house, I grabbed my camera bag. Anybody travel with a camera? All right, Sarah says yes, with a capital Y-E-S. All right, yeah, I used to do that quite often, uh, travel with a camera. So traveling with a camera, here are some shots that I got when I had my camera. And it brings back stories and memories as well. There's a black bear. A story, you know, the story there behind that literally uh, is that was taken at Kingdom Come State Park. 
And uh, a matter of fact, I can remember the day it happened. It actually happened on September the 1st, 2005. And I did not look that up earlier today. I can remember that. It's a beautiful day in September, September. So it told a story. So I had my camera that day and was able to capture that uh, picture. There's another picture. Uh, I think that was the same year, opening day of deer season. Uh, that's at uh, Merle and Shad, that's at Eddie Saltus Overlook. Uh, Shad, that's the tree that was removed uh, a few years back when that sign was put in there uh, because that tree was in the way. Um, there's a frog because I had my camera. That was not a, uh, a cell phone camera either. I actually had my camera that day. Fire pink, catch fly. There's Mitch and an eagle, because I, I had my camera. Train, uh, that's at Elkhorn City. That's the Pool Point Trestle. That's a story too, if you're, if you're a rail fan, uh, can anybody, that's Elkhorn City would be back to the left or behind me. Can anybody tell me which direction that train is traveling by looking at that? Anybody know? Hey, y'all get y'all get homework in here. I'm going east. Going east. Well, which direction is it traveling? Is it I should say, is it traveling towards me or away from me? <laughs> and I'll give you a clue here in a minute. If you'll notice the coal loads, if you'll notice the coal loads. Uh, it's loaded with coal, and the coal leaves Elkhorn City going south. So those are actually a pusher set of engines. So you get you get a free history lesson there as well. So or geography. So those are the six. Those are just six photos that I captured uh, along the way because I had my fa camera. Okay, traveling with with your camera. I left my camera at the house, but I got this one. That's what I got. Uh, I, I missed on photos, missed on several photos because I left my camera at the house. And I've done that. Fortunately, cameras have gotten a little bit better on cell phones, but I have left my camera at the house and missed on a pile of photos, and I know you all have too. So know your, know your camera. Uh, have you read the owner's manual? Make sure you read that owner's manual. Uh, and a lot of times you'll find a manual specifically for a camera that actually has a little bit more information. Also, how many megapixels is the camera capable of producing? Does it have optical zoom, digital zoom, or both? This is for point and shoot cameras. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right quick. Can y'all see me pretty good? Can y'all see me now that I've stopped sharing my screen? Yep. All right. This here is just a point and shoot camera. I like this. Uh, it's literally smaller than my cell phone, as you can tell. Smaller than my cell phone. And I like that because I can put that in a backpack or uh, I can put that in my turkey vest or, or put it in my pocket. And this is great to have. Now, one of the things is about this, it has what's called optical zoom and digital zoom. Optical zoom is, it goes out so far and you get your true photo. Digital zoom, it literally cranks things in and you're going to start to get fuzzy because it's, it's digitizing it on the end. So the more optical, if you're using these right here, the more optical zoom you have, the better off you are. Now, a lot of times you'll see cameras, um, uh, for a really good deal, like 50 or 60 bucks, and it'll have an optical zoom of like 10 and have a do digital zoom of like 25 or 20. Uh, it's cheap because digital zoom is cheap. So you want something with a lot of optical zoom and less digital zoom. And this one here actually has, uh, I don't remember, it doesn't say on it for some reason. I thought it said it on it here, but. Um, but I know it has more optical zoom than it has digital zoom just for that. So let me go back to sharing my screen again. And I'm probably going to go come back and forth share my screen uh, uh, if that's all right with you all. 
So knowing the camera, knowing what your camera is capable of doing. And I'll give an example. Uh, I had bought a brand new camera several years ago, came up on a uh, bear, some bears. It was late in the evening. Uh, the, the daylight out there was uh, much darker than what it is right now. It was right, right, I mean, the sun was setting. And my settings on my camera were off because it was brand new. I hadn't had time to figure it out. And I missed really good shots. I took 72 shots of some bears and I only got one that was worth anything. So know your camera. So basically I set the next day in a low light situation and I set the camera up. So if I ever had that situation come up again, I would be ready for it. So knowing that camera. All right, camera bag. Um, first of all, do you have one? Why should I have one? What's in it? Can I quickly access those items if I need to? So I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop sharing again right quick. So I have a camera bag. Mine is in backpack form and had a, it has everything that I need in it. Um, it's got my camera. I carry my, my DSLR in it. And, and also it has a side pouch that guess what? This little guy, he rides along too. But with a DSLR, I've got my extra lenses. I've got every lens in case I need to switch out uh, in the middle, you know, in the middle of a shot or uh, I catch something that I need more telephoto or, you know, something that a wide angle or, you know, uh, so I, I switch that out. Sunny day, I've got lens hoods and I have literally run back to the truck before to grab lens hoods. But there's one thing, you know, you, you've got several items in there. Uh, you know, you may have a, a lens duster or something like that, some lens cloth, uh, like I said, the lens hoods. Right here's the number one thing. You better have extra batteries. And I won't say I learned the hard way, but uh, got on a, 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 a photography expedition one time of shooting, shooting some elk. And I got away from the truck too far and the battery went dead uh on on the camera and i had to run back to the truck fortunately had a extra rechargeable battery ready to go popped it out popped this one in the camera and continued shooting the elk and got some really good photos uh of that elk along the way so uh, uh even if you don't have your pack with you if you leave your pack in the car at least grab an extra battery and shove it in your pocket. I tend to do that quite often. And uh, if you're using a, a flash, if you're using an external flash, grab some extra batteries to go with that and shove those in your pocket as well. Uh, Cause at some point in time, you're gonna be forced to have to use those. So um, let's go back to sharing the screen again. So I hope you, I presume you've got a camera bag. You've got something you put your camera in. Uh, I've got a small pouch. You might be able to see that. Uh, I've got a small pouch that the small one goes in, that uh, the point shoot goes in. Why should you have one? You need to have all your camera junk, so to speak, all your camera stuff in one spot. And it stays there all the time. That way, if, you, if you're looking for something, that it's there. I mentioned about what's in it, uh, things that are in there, those extra lenses, if you have a DSLR, uh, extra batteries, uh, whether it be, you know, the AA or AAA or a rechargeable battery. And you need to have quick access. I had a camera bag that was great. It held everything, uh, including the kitchen sink. Uh, and it was huge. It was great. It was comfortable to carry. But the problem is, is the design on it was horrible. And I got in a situation one time that I pulled up at a location and I was, I can't remember what I was trying to photograph, but I was trying to get in that bag and I could not get into that bag quick enough. And I missed the shot. So can you, you know, can I quickly access those items if I need to? So that's, that comes down to the design of the bag. I like a backpack 
uh, top bag, uh, and basically the backpack top bags is all your lenses. If you're carrying, if you're using a DSLR, all your lenses, your camera, everything is on the bottom of the bag that I've got, and then on the top are a lot of the accessories um, on the top. So. All right, taking uh, those precious photos, uh, holding, the, holding the camera and the posture. And you know, this one's a tough one to do here. And I hope you can see me again. This was a tough one to do uh, with a virtual deal. But what you wanna do is hold the camera. If you're using a DSLR or whether you're using the point and shoot, uh, hold it with two hands, you know, put two hands on it. And if you can brace yourself somehow as you shoot, as you shoot with the, uh, the camera, if you can brace yourself and, uh, you know, hold steady, that's the main thing. Uh, so uh, you need a good posture, however that works. I will add too is the way you hold your camera. I have seen uh, photographers, they will literally get their hands in the way of things uh, if you'll notice, I'm, I'm right-handed, so this is easy. And if you'll notice, I keep a strap on mine. And the way my thumb, the strap comes across my thumb, that if I accidentally drop that, I can catch it as before it hits the ground. Uh, so I keep my thumb under the strap. That's just something that I do that I've, I've always done. I hold it with my left hand and if I'm turning up to do a vertical shot, my left hand is holding it. I've seen people do it this way. And literally, if you'll notice, if you'll notice my hand can be in the way of the lens. And I've seen people get their hands in the way of a lens here and they'll cut off the bottom of a shot because their fingers in the way. And so what you wanna do is hold the camera like this with your right hand on the top, on the shutter, and your, on your left hand kind of cradling. And what I do is I bring my elbow into my chest and that helps me hold the camera when I pull it up. Uh, so uh, I just kind of, I'm using double. And what I do is I tend to pull, if I'm shooting a DSLR, I tend to pull my pinky finger, my right pinky finger underneath it. And that helps stabilize it as well. Uh, but the big thing is putting my thumb through there. And basically it's the same thing. If you are, you know, shooting a, a point and shoot, just make sure you're getting a, uh, a good firm grip on it, uh, that you, you know, you're not dropping it. These things are handy. They've got the, you know, the lanyards and you can put that through your wrist, uh, just to make sure you're not going to drop that. I'm more worried about dropping my, my DSLR than I am the point and shoot. So, I typically don't use the lanyard, but that, that's just a couple of, of, of pointers there that I tend to use. I'll go back to the PowerPoint presentation. So that's a little bit on how to hold the camera and the posture, just to make, um, uh, you know, hold the camera. Now, I typically, if, unless I'm just in a crazy predicament, if I can, you know, I put my uh, feet usually about shoulder width and, uh, you know, to, to get a good solid stance uh, with the camera. That way I'm not too shaky with it. And the good thing is on some of this shake stuff, there is a, there is some, you know, some anti-shake devices on some of the new lenses, uh, depending on uh, what, uh, what brand of camera. Uh, sometimes the camera, if you're shooting DSLR, the, the lens has the uh, anti-vibrate and uh, on one brand and then on another brand, you may have the, uh, the actually the camera body that is uh, anti-vibrate. Right. So how you hold that camera makes a difference. Now, matter of fact, this is one of those photos that Shad was with me on that, this one here that was at, down at Land Between the Lakes several years ago. And this was shot with a point and shoot camera. And if you'll notice, I am shooting horizontally. Uh, so how you hold the camera makes a difference. It's a horizontal shot. I automatically turned it up to a vertical. It grabs the sun and it grabs more of a peach tone to it and it darkens everything a little bit. So you can see there, 
you can see the green of the trees and the grass and that sort of thing. And the sun is just above that horizon. Uh, if you can see my cursor, it would be just above the horizon there uh, of the photo. But then I grab the sun there and you don't see necessarily to see the green, everything is dark. And I wish you all could actually see the photo and it printed out, it has a deep peach color to it. Just, it's totally different between the two, which is, uh, which is really neat. So how you hold that camera makes a difference. Now, one of the things I've, I've left ditch the date stamp in here. Years ago, everything uh, had a date stamp on it. I can remember some of the, uh, the newer 35 millimeter cameras, they put, started putting a date stamp on them. And uh, uh, if, if you know what I'm talking about, it's, it's the right here in the lower right hand corner, it's that date stamp or a time stamp. And so that one actually had a date stamp. Uh, and what I did on this one here is for the photo, I took the date stamp out. You can see down here on the right hand corner, it's gone. So I just manipulated the photo and took it out. Uh, there was a lady several years ago, she was showing me and a friend of mine some photos she had taken. And she said, and I, they're, they're beautiful. I mean, I'm talking great photos, potential award winning photos, uh, publishable photos, but every one of them had a date and a time stamp on them. Um, they all had a date time stamp on them. And I said, ma'am, I said, you know, you've got some great photos. You've got a great eye here. But the problem is, is the date stamp, the time stamp on there. You need to ditch that. Now, I've started seeing that come back now, even on a digital level. It's like you can add those things in there now. Um, and she said, well, I want to know when I, when I've taken the photo and I know we've talked about that earlier, you want to know that you've actually done something, uh, and be able to prove it. And she said, I want to know, uh, when I took that photo and the time I took that photo. And so I started to explain it to them. Now this is an old one here. We don't need date stamps because we have metadata. As a matter of fact, every camera, I don't know if you all have done that before, but every camera, digital camera, you can go back and you can go into the properties of that. And as long as you've got the time correct on it and the date correct on it, it actually shows. So if you'll see down here at the bottom, it shows that a picture was taken on June the 23rd, 2007 at 1136 AM. Uh, it shows what the camera was, that it was a Nikon D70S. It talks about the DPIs. It talks about the pixels, everything. It talks the f-stop, the exposure time, Everything is there. As a matter of fact, they are starting to, they have been using for the last several years, metadata in uh, uh, copyright uh, litigation. Because the thing is, there's a lot of photos that show up in places that people have taken, but they were used by somebody else. And so when it went to the court of law, uh, the person who had the photo had one thing, but the person who took the photo actually had the metadata, uh, which was what was taken originally with the photo, because that will change. Uh, for instance, if you'll notice up there, it says DSC um, underscore one six, uh, 1603. That's the actual, that's the actual photograph number. And so when you actually uh, manipulate that photo and you change it to Jeremy's dog, uh, it will actually change some of the some of the metadata on there. So uh, we have no need for those date stamps. And then recently on, on a social media platform, I actually saw a date stamp come up in the bottom of a photo. So evidently people are starting to use those again. So megapixels. That was a big, that was a big, big thing. Um, it's been several years ago. We don't see as much megapixel growth as we once did. It was like first digital camera I had had a mega had megapixels. It was 0 0.53. That's that's just over a half a megapixel. Basically, if I took a picture uh, to print that out and it looked great, you I could put it had to be no bigger than a postage stamp. Uh, it was one of those things. So megapixels is 1 million pixels, which is per inch. Um, 
any of the small discrete elements that uh, together constitute an image as on a television or a computer screen. And that's according to Webster's Dictionary. So there's your megapixel. Uh, I don't get too tore up on megapixels. Uh, I'm sitting here with two cameras, one that has, I think, 16 megapixels, and the other one, the point shoot, I think it's about eight. And unless I'm putting something up on a billboard, uh, that's all I need. And I noticed they've gone to uh, 24, 36. I mean, I remember several years ago that megapixels actually just kept skyrocketing and the price went with them. And, you know, you went from a four megapixel and somebody said, I got an eight, but it's going to cost me $300 more. And it just, you know, one of those things is megapixels kept going up, the dollars went up, but that's kind of flattened off a little bit. So I don't really get too tore up over megapixels because I have some great photos that, I, that I've taken with a small megapixel camera and I have great photos that I've taken with a large megapixel camera. Now, there is some clarity. You, you see some clarity with the better megapixels. So especially when you're shooting still photography. So I take that back. My first digital camera was a 0.35. There is an owl that I took, you can see there, that's an old photo in 2002. Um, and that, to pr if you'll see the graininess even in there on this digital, it, it printed out, it's even grainier. It would look wonderful on a, on a postage stamp with the words forever underneath it. So um, when you printed out at a four by six, it was actually, absolutely, it was just grainy. Uh, you can see, the lighting on it was terrible, but that was during the days of a, you know, uh, some of the newer um, digital cameras. Matter of fact, that one there, the media for it was a three and a half inch floppy disk. And somewhere I have a pile of three and a half inch floppy disk with some really cool photos on it, but they're not necessarily worth anything at 0.35 megapixels. But we were capturing memories. We were capturing some cool stuff and you really couldn't, get anything over about a four and a four to six uh, on photo. <clears throat> now, you know, here's one whole lot better, whole lot better photo. That's with a, that's with a 5.1 megapixel. Uh, you can see two years later, uh, you know, they're, they're now developing a little bit better photos and uh, a, a five megapixel camera is a good one. That's a good, that's a good uh, uh, camera. I've shot a lot of photos with 5.1. Uh, six, uh, that sort of thing. And you can start to see the clarities. That photo right there is beautiful, printed out on an eight by 10. Uh, matter of fact, I've done that before and it's, it's a great photo on eight by 10. There's a 6.0 uh, of squirrel. And so it's, and the lighting was a little, little bit bad on that, but you've got some clarity in there. And so I'm okay with these five five megapixels, I'm six, eight, 12, that sort of thing. And then there's a 12 megapixel and you're starting to see a little bit better there. The snow was flying that day and you can see some detail uh, in that cold hopper there. So it gets a little bit better. Um, I wanna mention framing the object. Does anybody on here, uh, shoot uh, specifically to uh, to hang pictures, map pictures, and hang them on the wall. You can open open the mic up or what have you. Only if they're good enough. Only if they're good enough. Only if they're good enough. And we'll get, we'll get into that in a minute, Shad. Only if they're good enough. So if you're shooting for printing or, or anything, here's what I'm going to say. If you're framing that object, give it some room. Uh, got somebody that's put something in the chat. Uh, no, but li would like to, okay. Uh, any, any photo you take can be, can be printed. That's, that's no problem at all. But you wanna frame that object. Every time I take a picture, I'm taking a picture to where I'm gonna print that picture at an eight by 10. Uh, with the possibility of something bigger or something smaller. So you want to frame that object and you want to give it some room. Now, I don't have the ability to bring a mat out here and show you that sort of thing, unfortunately. But I'm going to explain it the best I can. So you want to give that some room. If you'll notice here, um, these birds here, 
if you'll look, if you'll see, there's plenty of room on the top and the bottom and the left and the right. I've centered it up pretty much the object. You're sending an object up and I didn't zoom in tight on that, you know. Uh, so I gave it plenty of room on, on the sides, the top and the bottom. Now here is one of my favorite photos. I love this photo. But you see on the left-hand side, I cut the end of the tongue off of this hay rake. And at the top, it lacks about a quarter of an inch from being cut off at the top. So this, this photo here, if I printed it out on an eight by 10, it would mat up perfectly because what's gonna happen is when you print that off at an eight by 10, it's going to even, even an eight and a half by 11 using a whole sheet. It's gonna automatically cut some of that photo off at the top, the bottom, and both sides. It's, that's just the nature of it. Um, look at this photo here. It's gonna cut it off, and if you can see my cursor here, it literally cuts the photo off right at the top of that hay rake wheel. Now, a mat, an eight by 10 mat is not a true eight by 10 mat. It's just a little bit smaller than an eight by 10. And so when I mat that, it's gonna cut it off even more on the sides. And so what happens is, as I literally, the way I framed that and the way I didn't give it enough room, I hurt the photo. I hurt the photo when it come down to um, uh, matting it and framing it. And um, so uh, that's, that's what you wanna do. You wanna frame that object. And when I hand, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing a family photo and I hand the camera to my dad and say, here, give it plenty of room, uh, you know, and, and that means give it plenty of room on the bottom, the top, and both sides, uh, and center the object. Whereas I messed up on that photo, a great photo that I felt, uh, and other than some lighting issues, but I can work on that, I can manipulate that. But the problem is, is because of the framing, I hurt that. Uh, also, I wanna throw this out here too. Uh, when framing the object, what's the subject? Uh, and everybody has a story that you're telling with a photo. And everybody, uh, if you handed it to three people, that photo, or showed three people that photo without saying anything, they would have a different opinion of it. So framing the object, what's the subject? What story do you want to tell if you're showing somebody a photo or you're putting it in a contest or something like that? So you make them guess what the subject is maybe. Now, you've got Ben here and um, he's standing there in some ferns. You've also got the light coming in behind him. You know, me as the photographer, what was I trying to relay here? Uh, and so you gotta make them guess. The first, per first thing that you may see that stands out may be the light or it may be Ben, or it may be the forest floor or that tree with that, uh, with that piece of engineering ribbon tied to it. Um, so make them guess what that subject is. Um, make them, you know, uh, then sometimes you, you may want that subject to be specific, but that's kind of a good uh, idea there. Here's this optical versus digital that I was talking about earlier. There's the optical. This was an older camera. I took that at Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, and if you'll notice, it's just, it's, it's zoomed in as far as optical will go. And uh, great, great photo. I mean, you can look at anything there and come up with, hey, Jeremy's trying to come up with something there. Uh, what's Jeremy trying to come up with? And so, uh, I centered the photo, I zoomed it into as, as far as optical would go, and I got that photo. Digital, here's what digital does. If you'll notice those people standing there on the back of that, on the top of that hauler, I then zoom in. And you've got people standing on top of the hauler. If you're familiar with NASCAR, there's Richard Petty. There's his cousin, Dale Inman. 
But what I did is I cranked that up into a digital type photo. And what happened is I didn't, I didn't zoom, I didn't blow this up uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a program. I literally went into digital zoom with my camera, this point and shoot camera. But if you'll notice the light, uh, you got a lot of glare, you got some haziness to it because what it was doing, it was just cranking it up. It, it was blowing it up itself. And I know y'all done that with uh, cell phone cameras. You know, you'll, uh, you know, you can zoom in on, uh, uh, you know, zoom in on it, you know, if, you know, pinch and drag and that sort of thing. And, uh, but that's what I mean about the optical and the digital zoom. So a camera that has the more optical zoom than digital is going to cost you more money, but it's also going to give you a better quality. That's if you're dealing with a point and shoot camera. DSLRs do not have digital zoom. So flash, field flash or no flash, you know, and I throw this, I throw this in here. I don't use a lot of flash. That's just, that's just me. I don't use a lot of flash. And uh, so when to use the flash, when not to use the flash. No flash or flash. Here, here's JD, he's on stage. Uh, all I've got is there's no flash. I've got the flash turned off. If you'll notice, all he's got there is the, is the, the lights, the stage lights. If you'll notice, uh, there's some movement in his left arm. And so there's some glare there. There's some fuzziness there. And whatever I do, I'm not going to be able to take that out. If you look at around in, you know, the area around his hair, his glasses are a little bit fuzzy, that sort of thing. There's a lot of glare there. But I can add some field flash to it. And I can, and I can, uh, that helps me that look at his left arm now that helps a little bit look at the handkerchief look at the the mic stand uh and so that helps a little bit there uh i'm able to uh uh, uh you know work that a little bit better so the field flash helped me there if you'll notice the field flash no field flash on the left and all, you, all i'm doing is i'm just pointing it into that pine cone and taking the picture and then i decided hey I'll add some field flash there. And so I add some flash and this is just the internal flash of the camera, the flash that's on the camera. I think this was a point shoot, may have been a DSLR, but I think this was a point shoot. Um, so I turn the flash on and so it brings that pine cone out. It still uh, gives me what I want, but it brings that out. So there's one. Then on fireworks, when you're shooting things at night and you're wanting to get, get a, a shot of something, don't use flash. Fireworks is one of those. Because had I used flash on this fireworks, uh, I would have gotten just a bright blob of probably blue uh, or purple or yellow. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just a bright blob, probably a lot of smoke in there. Uh, but if you'll notice, I turned the flash off. I took a good stable balance. I was shooting free-handed, didn't was it shooting with a with a tripod. And um because I had the flash turned off, that's what I got. Uh, also, uh, where's the source of light? You know, you gotta think, you're dealing with the sunshine outside. I shoot a lot outside. I shoot it outside more than I shoot inside. I prefer it outside. Um, so you got a lot of sunshine, you know, evening or morning. Uh, evenings tend to be softer than mornings. Um, do you need some artificial lighting? Like I said, do you need a flash? Do you need an external flash? Uh, I've seen people use flashlights, uh, you know, at, uh, at late in the evenings, early in the mornings, and it works. So where's your source of light? Storing your photos. Now we've taken all these great photos and uh, we want to do something with them. Um, in latter years, I've gotten worse than what I used to be. I, I was really good, really good at when I came in from a shoot, uh, whatever it was, if I shot 10 photos, I would take the photos and I would take them and put them on an external hard drive. At that point in time, I would back that external hard drive up and I kept the hard drives in two different spots. Uh, that was just, you know, this was before the cloud type stuff. So storing photos, what I typically do is um, on my storage of photos, I'll put the year, say 2020, 
uh, I'll put on, if I'm out shooting, say, uh, if I'm out shooting nature photos, I'll put nature on it, or be under the file under 2020, and then I'll dump all my photos in there. And so if I go back in, you know, if I've shot photos in 2004 and I'm looking for something that was nature, I can go to 2004, I can go, what I'll do is I'll go to 2004, it'll be the camera, uh, Nikon 5700, um, and then I'll go into nature and it'll, and I'll be able to find it there. Uh, and, uh, that helps me. Flash drives are great. The thumb drives, they're wonderful to use those. The big thing now is putting in the cloud. Uh, and you know, most of these cloud servers, they're backed up on three or four different servers. If one goes down, you still have it. Uh, they are pricey. Uh, so you're having to pay a price per year or price per month, whether you use it or not, but they are nice because uh, you can access it anywhere. Uh, hard drives are much cheaper now, uh, but I would typically have two hard drives, like I said, one to, back, one to put my photos on, then back it up. And normally I would take that hard drive and leave it somewhere else like my mom and dad's or something like that. But I think I even have a, a hard drive still out there. Uh, so I'm, I'm storing it in two different places. Same, same with flash drives. Um, you know, this, my, my storage is in two different places. That way I don't lose it. The cool thing is about the cloud, you're paying for a subscription yearly and you can store that there. And they're, they're literally putting it in three or four different places for you. And it, it's going to be there. Now, what you run into on some of the things with the cloud is some of these places, when you put it up there, you're going to lose some of the, the quality of the photo on some of the places. So make sure um, that you're not going to lose any quality that when you when you upload it to the cloud that when you download it, you've got the 100 100% photo that you uploaded, uh, like you would if you were putting it on a flash drive or a hard drive or whatever. So um, for instance, if you're putting a photo on social media, when you upload that thing, and it may be something that uh, that's 10 megabytes, and it takes forever to upload, and it's a wonderful photo that you're sharing on whatever social media platform, and then you'll go back and you'll look for that photo and think, hmm, I believe I'll download that to my phone and print it. It's no longer that 10 megapixel photo. Uh, you're losing some quality because what happens is, is they compress that. So if you're looking at something in the cloud, make sure that that place is not compressing photos for you. So print your photos. Uh, print your photos. Uh, I don't print a lot of photos. I've got one camera uh, that I have probably taken. I know I've taken over 11,000 photos on it. And the photos printed off of it is probably more like less than 100 uh, and maybe closer to 50. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, we don't do a lot of anymore is print photos. And so we've got a lot of digital that uh, uh, we've got stored back. Uh, you know, and you're, personally, I've got thousands. Like I said, I've got one camera that was over 11,000. Uh, you know, between two or three cameras, I've probably got 20,000 photos. Uh, and uh, they're all digitized and very few of them have been printed, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, I guess we'll see, you know, we've got photos that, that's been around since the 1800s that you can pull up and, and, and look at that, that are family photos or something and digital photos. I don't know what they're going to look like in uh, uh, the year 2200, so to speak. Um, probably really don't, really don't care, but uh, uh, on something like that. But uh, so I want to talk a little bit about manipulating the photo and there's several programs out there uh, to be able to manipulate the program or the, the photo. This is an image that came directly from my camera. It was a DSLR. Uh, this is another one of those, those stories. Um, my dad and I chased uh, the Southern 630 uh, from Bulls Gap, Tennessee to Bristol, Virginia a few years ago. I think that was like 76 rail miles and was able to hit several stops. And this was one of them here at Bluff City. And uh, it was a really cool shot because, uh, matter of fact, it was multiple shots. And this was just the, the center shot, the, the better of the, that I felt of all of them. And so um, I actually uh, uh, started taking several photos. And when the, uh, uh, when the locomotive got to the end of the bridge there on the right, 
uh, the firemen started shoveling coal uh, and the black smoke started to roll and there were about 10 or 12 photographers standing right there in an area on top of each other uh, underneath the bridge. And so if you'll notice I'm shooting up, if you'll notice the bridge is kind of laid back at the angle and it's kind of a flat, funny looking angle. If you'll notice the piers that are in the that are in the, the river there, they're kind of at a funny angle. They're kind of kicked to the right. And it's just a really funny looking photo. So you've got this tree on the upper left hand corner, which is not bad. It's a nice framing. Tree on the right hand right hand side is framed up very nice. But the lighting was terrible. And so I decided to start manipulating this, manipulating this photo with the, with the program. So I cropped it and I enhanced it some, and that helped it a little bit. And all I did is cropped it down and I went from this full frame image to this here by cropping it and enhancing it. And I tilted it a little bit, if you'll notice, See how those piers are, uh, the top of the bridge is kicked away and the, pre, uh, the piers are kind of to the, to the photographer. It's all leveled things up a little bit. So it's leveled up a mite. And if you'll notice that black smoke, sky looks a little bit better. It was really overcast that day. And there was a lot of bright in the west. The sun was, this point in time it was in the afternoon. So the sun's setting in the west. And so I cropped it and enhanced it a little bit. Then I rotated it a little bit more. If you'll notice, I went to the piers, the bottom, the base of those piers, and I leveled those up a little bit. And basically that's all I did. And I cropped it and um, I have printed it out in an eight by 10. Matter of fact, out in my barn out back, I have a copy because it's too big to bring in the house. I have a copy uh, that is two foot by three foot uh, of this photo. And it printed out excellent. Um, matter of fact, uh, back here in the RPO, you can see there's a little guy and he's looking out. And on the photos, you can see um, uh, the, the fireman there, uh, or what would be the fireman on the fireman's side there uh, looking out. But uh, so the photo turned out really good. Now, one of the things that it does is in this area here, where I'm showing with my cursor. When I uh, print it out in an eight by 10, it cuts that off. And so it, it, it leaves a funny looking blob there with the, uh, uh, with the smokes, uh, with the smoke. And then it cuts it off here uh, as well on eight by 10. But with a, that full uh, 24 by 36, I get that whole photo. Uh, so basically all I did is straight out of the camera, I cropped it and enhanced it, and I rotated it a little bit more. I see somebody's coming in or chat there. Uh, how can you determine how large of a print to make of, uh, make of a picture without it beginning to look grainy or pixelated? Um, good question. I just felt that I had enough pixels to make it happen, and I wanted to try it. Uh, and so uh, one of the things is, is when I was able to look at it, Aaron, uh, I was able to look that the picture was not grainy. It was sharp. And the last time that I rotated it, I looked at the sharpness on it. And I, when I enhanced it, I added some sharpness to it. And so it took a lot out. And so as long as I didn't have fudgy, fuzzy edges, on, uh, especially on uh, sharp edges like around the top of this tender or around some of this, uh, uh, the light on the locomotive, uh, as long as they were not fuzzy, even on the on the uh, on the piers here, as long as it wasn't fuzzy, I felt that I could get it up to a 24 by 36, or at least try it. And when I printed it, it's a little fuzzy, but I think it had to do a lot with the lighting and how much I had to manipulate it. Uh, but on an eight by ten, there's no fuzz uh, at all. It's not grainy or anything like that. But there's a little bit of a graininess on that 24 by 36, but that's the only photo that I have ever printed on 24 by 36. And I had the opportunity to do it. I have a friend of mine who had a, uh, who has a, uh, the ability to do it. And I showed it to him and he said, let me print that for you. And I said, I'll send it to you. Uh, but, 
So basically, uh, just looking at the photo and seeing how grainy it is from the get go, but it prints out great on an eight by 10 with no grainy. So after all that, I'm gonna tell you, enter a contest. Um, and as we wrap up, uh, this day and time, uh, there's digital contest. Uh, I don't know that, I've never entered a digital contest. Every contest that I've ever entered has been a printed contest. And um, you print it off, you take it to them. Uh, and uh, I've entered some really good contests. Uh, matter of fact, one of the best ones I ever entered, there was a one in Kingsport that has taken place for years. Uh, used to take place in the spring, and I think it's now in the fall or vice versa. But uh, when I took, I took three photos to them, entry fee about $10 a photo, and I just wanted to see how my photos stacked up with somebody else. And when I walked in there, there were photos of all different sizes, all different shapes, you know, the whole works, good photos, bad photos, really good photos, really, really, really good photos. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I did was uh, I wanted to see how my photos matched up. And that's what you're doing with the contest. Uh, but that day I felt like I was taking three sheep to slaughter uh, because I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted to see how they matched up with others. And that's one of the things that I've done with my photography is um, I tell people who all the time, and I, I'm not a professional uh, photographer by any means, by no means. Uh, advanced amateur, yeah. Um, but what I typically do is I look at, at photos of other people. And if I, especially at a contest, if I'm in a contest or I go to look at photos at a contest, I want to see what the winners look like. First, second, third place. I want to see how they've done, done that photo. That way I can, uh, you know, make my photos look like theirs. Now, I'm not taking the same photos that they're taking, but it may be a photo that they're, they're taking in a place I know I'll never go. But I know a place that has, you know, uh, you know, something that, you know, a bridge that looks just like the bridge they took or, or, you know, a turkey or whatever. And so it allows me at these contests, the first place winner, they can say, hey, I can do that. Or, hey, I can do better than that. And so in our contest, in our contest, that way you're putting your work up against everybody. One of the things too is when you enter a contest, a lot of contests will have amateur division and a professional division. One of the things I always tell people, enter the professional division. If you want to, if you want your, if you want your photos to be against the best, that's where you want them. You want them in the, in the best, you want them in the, against the best categories. Uh, now, you know, maybe the first one, you first one or two, you want to do amateur or something like that. But I tell everybody and I, and I have sat, I have entered photos at contests before, have somebody to come in to enter pictures and had to, and, you know, talk them into putting them in there against me knowing that I could get beat by their photo because their photo was that good, but they needed to know, they needed to know, hey, your photo needs to be in the amateur, you know, in the, in the professional division. Um, but, um, uh, so, inner contest, glad that. So, any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'm gonna start sharing right, right quick. Any questions, any discussions? If you want to, you can open open your mic up or whatever. My, my thing is, is unfortunately, I do not take photos, the amount of photos like I used to. And I hate that. Uh, I just don't take the time to do it. And that's my fault. When I leave the house every day, I don't take my camera or cameras with me. Uh, I guess because I rely on this guy here that if I come across something, I can take a photo and it's nearly as good. Um, they are put pictures on social media. Uh, Aaron, I have, uh, say on my own post, uh, I've been, I've had them published on social media before as well. So I've had, I've had uh, photos on social media. Um, you know, I've got, I've got a Facebook page. And so I put up, I put up some from there. Uh, one of the things that I try not to do is my best photos I try not to put them on my Facebook page because uh, there's a good place for them to get stolen. And I've had them to do that before and wind up, you know, in places that I may not want them to wind up. 
And so it's a deal of if I'm going to take them to a contest, I don't want them to be tied to my social media page and them already be seen and a judge see them already uh, or something like that. I want to surprise everybody in the house, so to speak, if I'm going to take them to a contest. So I typically, when I take some photos, I'm thinking, hey, at some point in time, whether it be this year or 10 years down the road, I may put these in a contest. But good question. But yeah, I do put them on some social media sites as well. Uh, from the office, uh, uh, if you go to the, some of the office pages, uh, our office page, the Harlan County Extension uh, Facebook page, the advertisements for the Zooms, there's three or four photos that I've used on there and those are some that I've taken. And uh, there's no questions. I, I just hope you get out there and take photos. I don't care what you're using to take them. Uh, several years ago when, when photos became popular with camera, with, uh, with the cell phones, I asked a, I asked a photographer uh, uh, who, who was, way I look at it, a professional photographer, had a lot of photos published. I asked her, I said, do you think that uh, cell phone photos are killing uh, the photos, you know, uh, hurting us, you know, hurting photographers, hurting photos. And she said, no, she adamantly told me no. Uh, so, uh, that made me uh, think a little bit different towards cell phone photos. And a lot of, a lot of places are having literally having contests for cell phone photos anymore. So, uh, not only is that $2,000, uh, DSL, uh, uh, camera, uh, have its place, but they're also, you know, that cell phone uh, has a place too. And so some places are, are even doing that now. Any questions, comments? Uh, thank you for the thumbs up, Merle. It's good to see everybody. I just hope y'all get out and shoot some. Hope y'all get out and shoot some. Thank you, Chad. Uh, Chef, uh, what do we got next week? I don't have that with me or I don't think I have. Uh, maybe I do have that with me. I've got it. We've got, uh, if y'all can hear me, it's the uh, successful lambing taught by Hunter Romero. I think it's his name. Yes. Uh, and then uh, Kyle Hill on Thursday is going to be speaking about waterfowl. Those should be two good ones and, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, uh, look forward to ever seeing everybody next week. Everybody have a wonderful friday and uh, a great weekend hey the yeah. colors are beautiful right now looking about having some rain uh tomorrow so get out there and get some of those photo fall photos taken hey chad yeah chad's got something to say too bad y'all ain't working tomorrow i was making fried apple pies tonight <laughs> no! <laughs> Merle, how could you do that to me <laughs> Hey, Sharon, I know where you live. I'll be up there. <laughs> he bragged on your pies today, and he said that you made 10, and he ate seven out of the 10. Yeah. And I told him how much I liked them, and now he's going to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> he's a working machine. Take good care of him. That's right. Good, good to see everybody. Everybody have a good one. See you all. Awesome.